Hi, I'm Dennis DiCicco, Senior Editor of Sky and Telescope Magazine here at the 2011 Advanced Imaging Conference in Santa Clara, California. I'm speaking now with Bob Denny, President of DC3 Dreams. I actually met Bob about a dozen years ago. We were both at a conference at Lowell Observatory with amateur and professional observers of asteroids. At the time, go-to telescopes were not quite a novelty anymore. A lot of amateurs were using them. People could just press a few buttons and have a telescope slew to a new object. Everybody thought that was pretty high tech. But Bob had a poster presentation going on, and he was talking about pure science fiction as far as we were concerned. Bob was saying, oh, not only can you have telescopes controlled by computers, you can control the cameras and the focusers and the observatory. You can set up a whole program to automate your observing. It was pure science fiction. In the ensuing years, Bob developed a product called ACP that would allow amateur astronomers to do just that basically controller observatories and today there are hundreds and hundreds of observatories around the world amateur observatories in backyards or halfway around the world professional observatories being run by schools and institutions that are all working with Bob's software completely automating the system so Bob I know you've done some more things since ACP and I want you to tell me what you're up to well, thanks Dennis and it's really great to be here I really appreciate it um, that was you pretty well covered the last 12 years Starting in 2006, for science imaging, we came up with a, a scheduling system which takes away the burden of having to figure out when to schedule your observations, where the object is in the sky at what time, what sky conditions exist at that time, and the moon and all of those things. And it basically assists science imagers when they have lots and lots and lots of targets to image to do that most efficiently but we hadn't really thought of it as a tool for astroimagers until very recently. All right, so your software was initially set up to automate the process, but you still had to tell it when to make the observations. That's correct. So then you've got a program that you made for science observers who really didn't, they needed to have something that could autonomously decide when to observe. That's correct. Observing consists of three phases. First, you decide what you want to observe. Then you'd have to decide when. And that, can, again, as I explained before, depends on both the position of the object in the sky and the conditions at the time. And then there's the how, which is all the details of operating the instruments, sequencing the operations to actually acquire the images. Which filters you want to use. Exactly. What length exposures. Right. That's what you specify when you say what you want. And then the, at, the, at the back end, there's a machine that sits there and goes from filter to filter and takes the images, stores them on disk. ACP automated the how, but you still had to determine when. So it was up to you to either start the run at the right time or start the run with a time directive in it which said wait until a certain time and then start observing. Either way, it was you that was in charge of the when. What the scheduler does is it automates the when also. So all you do is you decide what you want, you tell scheduler, perhaps months in advance, and then it looks at everything, every time it has to make a decision, it looks at everything out there and it decides what's appropriate to run right now. And then if there's more than one thing that's appropriate to run, it picks one and runs it. See, this sounds almost easy on one level, but when you start to think about it, how observing goes, you're saying that you can tell it months in advance you want images of a particular galaxy. And now it's looking at what circumstances to decide it's time to take an image. Right. You specify the conditions under which you want your images taken. And the scheduler looks at those specifications all the time. And when the specifications are met, the conditions, we call them constraints, then it says, okay, I can do this job now. The skies are in the right, the, the object is in the right position, the skies are in the right condition. I can do this now but there may be more than one of these things I could do now. So there's a second phase in all of this where it then looks at what it can do and picks one that it's going to do and then does it. So this software is basically looking at conditions like the moon that it can calculate where the moon is if an object is near enough to the meridian that you've specified and then it says okay these conditions are met I can now grab this observation and make it for you. Correct. It would send that observation to ACP which would then go actually acquire those images Meanwhile, the scheduler just sits and waits until ACP says that it's done. 
when ACP says, okay, I've done this, then it goes back through the same cycle again. It looks at everything it has to do, it decides which one it's gonna run next, and goes out and runs that. So the point being, there's no predetermined schedule on any particular night. It's called a dispatch scheduling algorithm. It just goes around in this loop. It does one, comes back, looks at everything, makes a decision, does that, comes back over and over all night. All right, so can this software monitor the weather conditions? Yes, both ACP and the scheduler monitor weather for two reasons. The first and important one is to make sure the weather's safe to observe. Secondly, it can monitor the weather conditions to decide what kind of sky condition it is. For different kinds of observing, there's different meanings of sky condition. For example, for science, you might want to be, look, be looking at photometric extinction. For astroimaging, seeing is more important. So you could take a seeing, you can, and there are people who are doing this, take a seeing monitor and convert that into a sky condition and then feed that in and it can make decisions as to whether it should do images based on whether it's good skies or excellent skies, for example. This is starting to sound a little bit like artificial intelligence no. for your observatory. It will, you can say I want my luminance images taken in excellent skies and I want my color images taken in less than excellent skies and if the sky if you've got an automatic sky condition monitor, it will shift gears in the middle of the night and start doing your looms if the sky gets good and you're not even there. The weather safety aspect of it is completely different. Where What happens there is if the weather gets unsafe, in other words, it looks like it's going to rain or there's lightning in the area or something, that's a different input to both ACP and scheduler. What happens is ACP sees the weather go from safe to unsafe it immediately stops observing and shuts down the observatory. Closes everything up. Right, safes it. The scheduler sees that whatever was running out here has finished, but with a weather error, and it sees the weather's bad, and so it just stops. It won't dispatch anything more. So it will sit there and wait, and this is really key. Let's say that, that weather interrupt lasts two hours. All right. At that point, what you don't want to do is pick up where you left off because the object that you thought was going to be here is now way over there, Where not in a position that you wanted it. All right. So instead, because it's a dispatch scheduler, let's say the weather gets good again, it opens back up, it goes back through that cycle I explained before, where it looks at everything, decides what the right thing to do now is, and sends that to ACP. So it picks up and does what it should be doing for the skies at that time. So I see what you mean. You really could program this months in advance, say, here's all the things that I'd like to do, right. and schedule or we'll figure out when the best time is to do them and do it. Right. So it takes the when out of observing. That's exactly the short way of saying it. So if your observatory is completely autonomous, it can be running observation. You don't even know it. That's correct. You could be someplace else in the world, and your observatory could be acquiring your images for you. Besides the automation of picking the time at night, those cycles I described mm -hmm. to you, there's a larger cycle that happens every day, and that is before sunset, it starts your observatory up. A little while later, it opens up to let thermally stabilize. Then it'll wait until the right time, sunwise, to take dusk flats, and it'll take flat fields. Then it'll sit there and wait until the sun is down far enough or it's dark enough to observe, and it'll start observing, as I described before. When it gets to be dawn, it'll stop observing, wait until the sky's right, take flats again at dawn, which can be different flats than what you took at dusk, close up, and then do your darks and biases for as long as you want. And you set up those plans ahead of time, they're standard plans, and then it'll shut all your equipment down. And then it sits there during the day, repeat, in the evening the opens up, blah, blah, blah. So there's that bigger cycle that it does every day, so it really is a hands-off system. All right, let me go back to a couple of basics here. I got a few questions okay. for you. So what type of equipment can you run with it? Any equipment, domes, telescopes, cameras, focusers that has an ASCOM driver that, that, that has that standard interface. I can work with it. You can talk to all of it. Yes, anything with a driver, that's the whole point of ASCOM, is to separate the devices and their differences from software like myself or Maxim or the other type of software out there that controls okay. these devices. All right. So you've got a computer in your observatory that's talking to all your devices Correct. and it's got this ASCOM connection. How are you able to communicate with that computer from where you are? Okay, besides all the things I told you that were in this and yep. the connections with the equipment, the software also has its own built-in web server. It's not Apache or any of the big web servers that you need to uh, um, administer, 
It's its own built-in web server and its own web page interface that lets you run everything, put in observations and monitor what's going on from any browser, any internet browser. So wait a minute now, so I can be any place where I've got access to an internet and an internet browser. Internet browser running on what? Anything. Anything? Yeah. iPhone, I Android phone, iPad, I got an iPad right here with it on it, um, or a Mac or a PC. It's completely neutral, platform neutral, outside the observatory. Windows is a very good, which is what my software runs on, it's a very good platform for building systems. But not everybody likes Windows as a user. But from, from outside the observatory, you see web pages that run on any platform. It's all modern HTML5 and, and Web 2.0 technologies that runs on mobile phones, Mac, and PC. So it's completely platform neutral. All right, so I'm picture something here right now. My observatory has been programmed months in advance to do some nice imaging, M51, where it's in a well part of the sky right now. I'm out here in San Francisco, and all of a sudden I learn that the supernova has been seen in M51. What, what can I do at that point? My observatory's back home. You I've can pick up your iPhone, load Safari, type in the URL, the standard URL of your observatory, bring it up, and you'll see what it's doing. It can tell me right now that it's busy yeah, taking it's, pictures. It's running such right. and such, yeah. whatever you All put right. in last month. Right. And then there's a form that you can use and type in M51 and, the, and, and, and then say high priority. You can set the priority at 100. Put it in there and it will go right off and take images of M51. So you can get, you, right away you can gain control of the system and a target of opportunity. Right. All right. But there's more to it. There's actually a whole system for picking up supernova and, and gamma ray burst events. It's probably a little beyond the, the, the scope of this, but there is an actual online system for picking up so, so can, transient astronomy events that would automatically start it. Oh, we had talked about this once before. So yes. this can actually monitor stuff that's going on, looking for information and news flashes that are coming over the internet and decide on its own that it should go after one of those yes, things? Yes, you can set it up ahead of time to look for what's called VO event alerts. Those events are sourced and sent out by NASA from the SWIFT satellite for gamma ray burst from the IAU C C CBAT, and I don't even know what that means, Center uh, for something. Anyway, they're uh, supernova alerts. and. Um, those things are sent out over this network. I run a uh, broker for those messages and, and my customers are hooked into my system. They receive those alerts and if they've set their system up for doing that, they'll have an automatic target of opportunity acquisition. If they choose, they can actually have that type of target kill whatever job is being run and have in other words, less than a minute response for like a gamma ray burst, which is important. The supernova is not that important yeah. because you can get on it. If you get on it within an hour, you're good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so this system has been set up. Let's say it, it's taken a target of opportunity or just the images that you've scheduled months in advance. How do you find out what's happened? There's a log that's kept of all of the actions that are taken each night, but there's also a web display of the entire observing queue that you can go in and look and see which what the state of each of the requests that you put in earlier is, whether it's still pending, whether it's been deferred until later because of conditions, or whether it's been completed or failed. And you can just see that in the display for everything you've put in there. All right, so then you can drill down and, and, and see why or what's going on with each one. So right. you've got a nice graphic display of everything that's there. So I say I want to take a nice color image of M81. I can go in in the morning and look at the log and see if the various entries for taking the red, green, and blue images, if they've all been completed. Yes, you can see what's been done and what hasn't been done, not only the night before, but any time in the past. What you're seeing is what it's already done and what it has left to do. You can look at that anytime you want. So when I know my images have been completed, I can just grab the files right. and start processing them. Actually, what, one of the things that we've come up with recently is as your images are acquired, we have it set up on a service, a cloud file service called Dropbox. I don't know if you've heard of it. I've heard of Dropbox. Okay, so Dropbox on your Mac or your PC, you have a folder that syncs to the cloud continuously. And that includes the machine that's in the observatory that's running the system. So as these images are acquired by the scheduler and by ACP, they get thrown out to the cloud and they just magically appear in right on your own computer. Just because the, it's automatically updated. The transport updated. from the observatory to your computer takes place in the background in almost real time if you've got a good 
uh, internet connection. You'll see these balloons popping up on your note MacBook or whatever with this image has been acquired, that image has been acquired. It just goes. It's really convenient. And we we try to recommend people to use that instead of trying to transfer it by the web or by FTP. The Dropbox thing works really great. Well, that's great. I can see why, because your image, when you... You don't have to lift the finger. Yeah. It's just really easy. All right. Is there any kind of a downside to all of this automation? Well, there's a perceived downside. You have no idea when you're going to get your images. Because it's a dispatch scheduler, because it makes decisions on a sort of demand basis as opposed to planning anything out, you don't know when it's going to be done with your images. But guess what? You can't predict the weather anyway. And the weather is the big constraint. So you may think at the beginning of the night, oh, tonight I'm going to get images of M51 or whatever. And then the weather turns bad and you're like, oh, well, okay, I'm going to bed. With the scheduler, you put all this stuff in ahead of time, and yeah, the weather gets bad at midnight, but then at two o'clock in the morning, it gets good again, and the thing wakes back up and gets more images. You wouldn't have done that generally. No. So your productivity goes up, and once you've loaded this thing up and it's started to, to, to deliver images to you, pretty soon, as Dr. Peter Prendergast said, I'm drowning in images. <laughs> it, Too it, much it data. Is very, it's surprising, and this is what we didn't really realize a few years until a few years ago when we tried this out on some astro imagers, and they're like, "Holy cow!" So, you know, that's why we're here um, talking about it because it was really a science tool, and it's in the beginning. But now it's made a good adaptation to astro images, right. and we've tried to fill in the gaps that these guys have fed back to us and turn it into a first-class tool for amateurs. Oh, uh, actually, that reminds me something about all of your software. Things I know from talking to you in the past. I mean, you really are open to getting feedback and working with oh, people. Yeah. yeah. Well, besides that, for for me, software is a service business and not a product business. So when somebody has a problem, I'm on it. But even more importantly, when someone wants something, I not only will take, a lot of times people will give me a suggestion for a feature, but I try to get beyond that. What are you trying to do? Not what feature do you want, but why do you want it? And I'm not being threatening. I try to say, why do you want it? Because a lot of times the feature that they suggest isn't the best way for them to get what they want. Yeah. And then I'll take that along with the other suggestions and look at the big picture and then make the changes to satisfy the most people. It's just engineering, and I love engineering, I'm an engineer. All right, so I've got one last question. How do you actually specify the observations that you want to make? Well, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get data into the scheduler, but as part of our effort to support astro imagers, we've done a special form that's on the web, of course, where you basically fill in the number of hours you want in a filter, and then the time for each sub-exposure and the binning. So you'll say, I want four hours of luminance at 600 second subs in binning two. Push it. It puts that into the scheduler. It, in the process, it cuts that work up into one hour chunks so that it has some flexibility in scheduling it. Then you go back and you change it to green subs of 400 seconds and binning two or four or whatever. And then push the button again, it puts that in, chops them up into one hour work packages. So it takes no time at all. You don't have to calculate how many exposures you need. You just basically tell it the total number of hours you want on this object. And scheduler figures and it, it out. And it figures out how many exposures you need and cuts it up into convenient size work packages, puts it out there, and then it will do those one hour chunks at a time. Boy, I can see this changing the way astrophotography is done. Yeah, we hope it will. We really do. Boy, that's amazing. Well, listen, I want to thank you very much for telling me all about your software. I'm sitting here thinking back to 12 years ago and going, this guy's got dreams that not, it's never going to happen. I can't imagine what it's going to be like in the next five or 10 years from now. Uh, we hope to continue to change the way things are done, but we're really having a good time. I totally love my job. Great. Listen, thank you very much. You're most welcome. I'm Dennis DiCicco for Sky and Telescope Magazine here at the 2011 AIC Conference.